My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at CSIS with the great privilege of leading our Europe research. We are absolutely delighted to be able to welcome Her Excellency, Excellency Florence Pali, Minister for the Armed Forces of France. Uh, Minister Pali uh, uh, accepted her responsibilities on June 21st of this year, so four months into the job. And as she uh, arrives here in Washington, uh, France has produced its Strategic Review of Defense and National Security, a document uh, that I certainly encourage all to read because as one of America's closest military security and foreign par policy partners. This document really articulates some of the great challenges of our time uh, and uh, France's priorities and how to focus uh, on those. Before I welcome the minister to the podium, the minister has had such a distinguished career in public service, serve, serving as a senior budget advisor to Prime Minister Jospin, but also holding very senior positions at Air France and France's national state-owned railroad company, SNCF. The minister knows logistics and uh, brings that skill set uh, to the, the ministry. Before I turn this over to her, I just want to pause for a moment um, and reflect uh, over the events of the last few weeks. On October the 4th, many Americans awoke to the news that we had U.S. forces in Niger, that they were on a counterterrorism operation in great and strong cooperation with France and its uh, counterterrorism operations in Mali and in the Sahel. We learned that as the tragic death of four U.S. Uh, Green Beret soldiers were lost, the first aircraft on the scene were French military aircraft and helicopters. I think this is a moment in time to reflect that it is our greatest allies and partners that are there when we need them the most, just as much as French aircraft flew over the skies after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. These are moments to reflect, and this is why this conversation is so important, why it's so important that Minister Palais is here to help us understand uh, France's strategic defense and national security priorities. So with that, on this beautiful fall day, please join me in welcoming Minister Palais. Thank you very much for the, to the CSIS for hosting me today and sorry for my voice which is not completely back but better than yesterday. Um, your institution is one of the most uh, highly regarded in a city that has many. Um, I'm well aware uh, that for the past six years CSIS has been named the um, world's number one think tank for international security by the Go to Think Tank Index. And your analysis is compulsory reading in Paris. I should also add, as a statement of interest, that we have a fantastic cooperation with you, with some French diplomats serving as temporary fellows at CSIS. And this sort of cross fertilization between administration and academia, which is not so frequent back in France, is of immense value. So in a word, thank you for being so good. Think tanks have a particular relevance today, you just said. When I look at the world today, I see the Middle East in fire, widespread terror, refugee crisis, tensions in the East and the, the occasional nuclear test or ballistic missile flashing by. So I see a lot a tank, but not much think. Our world is transitioning to an unknown place. It's difficult to read and your work is more important than ever. Now, being an, a practitioner and rather than an analyst, I will spare you a lengthy introduction. 
but I would like to say a few words about what I have in mind coming here to DC as a new minister for the armed, forced, armed forces of France. Uh, first, we have an all-weather friendship with America. We've been friends for a long time and we will remain. Yesterday was marking the 236th anniversary of the Yorktown victory. Mm. Our friendship is one of the heart and of the mind. Of the heart because the uh, French will never forget what America did for us when we were in distress. Of the mind because for nations like ours with democratic values and shared interests in an increasingly unstable world, it's necessary to cooperate. Commentators may well expand on whether France agrees with the current administration on climate, on UNESCO, or the like. But the bottom line is there are scarcely been a time when our two nations have been closer in military terms. We are engaged side by side in the fight against terrorism, from the Levant to the Sahel region. I've seen this with my own eyes in Iraq, in Sahel, in Africa and elsewhere. We are also engaged together in all the visible and not so visible reassurance and deterrence activities on NATO's eastern flank. All this attests that France is a serious, capable and committed ally. At the core of our partnership is the awareness that France and the United States share both similar security interests and common threats, and that we can best confront them together. This is true today and will be as true, if not more so, tomorrow. France has, is the, has indeed the intention to remain a serious and capable ally. Under President Macron's guidance, my ministry is starting an enduring financial and capability build-up that will ensure just that. Inherited from the past, the strong bilateral alliance we enjoy today must be maintained into the future, which will require the commitment of our two great nations. And I have no doubt that it will be the case. And I will work as much as I can to develop it further. Second, um, I am particularly honored to be here and to meet Asuna, Secretary Mattis. I've talked with him on a few occasions recently and I've been impressed by his authority, his charisma and his depth of vision. This trip has also been the occasion to meet with um, General McMaster, some members of, the, of Congress and to visit institutions of special interest to me, such as DARPA and the SCO, as uh, I place a particular emphasis on innovation in my own ministry. Third, <laughs> it's fascinating to come here as the representative of a new French administration an administration of new kind that we've not seen for a long time in our country. 
Our president is the youngest head of state since Napoleon. Most of the government comes from civil society rather than from professional politics. Gender is balanced and the president is set to reform the country thoroughly from labor law to taxation and beyond. He's very strong on defense and he will increase our budget to 2% GDP by 2025. He has a very special interest in foreign affairs with ambitions, uh, ambitious plans for the EU, a belief in norms and the power of diplomacy. And he places enormous value on the transatlantic friendship. So I believe you will see a lot of us in international affairs in the coming months. Coming to substance, I'd like to give a few thoughts about my priorities coming here today. The first is how to defeat terror. We have an excellent cooperation at all levels with the US on this. We have made a tremendous uh, headway recently. Raqqa fell this week. But the challenges are daunting too. In Iraq, we, we need to support the Iraqi government in consolidating its victory against ISIS and moving away from sectarian politics. This will take time, but we can see encouraging signs. We must also work to de-escalate current tensions with the Kurds. In Syria, by far one of the, of the most intractable international issues today, there is still much to do. We need to eradicate ISIS from its hideout in the middle Euphrates River Valley. There will come a time when the caliphate is no longer a geographic expression, but only an intention to kill. This will not be the end of the story. In Syria, we will still have critical issues to address before considering a redeployment. We should make sure not to leave too much of a mess behind. This means avoiding at least four things. First, a war with, with the Kurds. Second, a war involving Israel and soon also Lebanon. Third, an unpunished use of chemical weapons. And lastly, a governance, a governance sorry, that will fuel terror, whether from Sunni or Shia groups. So I know it sounds simple, but like this. In fact, it's not. In the Sahel, France is redeploying uh, 4,000 military uh, in a high intensity environment with tremendous support from the United States. And we are immensely grateful for that support. <coughs> there have been strong achievements. We've saved Mali from the Jews of Al-Qaeda. Terror groups are under pressure. But much more needs to be done. We can't be and don't want to be the Praetorians of sovereign African countries. They must be able to defeat terror on their own. The joint force of the G5 cell is meant for that. It will start its first operation soon and it needs definitely support. The UN wants to give it support and I hope everyone can become convinced that a robust UN assistance 
is necessary. And I would be happy if you all could help us spread the world, the word, sorry, in the Beltway. Beyond this theater's war, we have also an intense cooperation with the US on terror and intelligence. I hope it will be strengthened. One day, perhaps, all the untold stories of this cooperation will be told. And that day, we will have reasons to be proud. Our lives would be dull if there was only terror. Fortunately, if I may, there is also proliferation. Two places come to mind, Iran and North Korea. On Iran, we've noted President Trump's statement. The leaders of France, Germany, and the UK have reiterated both their urgent recommendation to stick to the GCPOA and their willingness to address Iran's ballistic missile program and regional activities. We need the GCPOA. Scrapping out would be a gift to Iran's hardliners and a first step towards future wars. But we should, we should also be extremely serious about the destabilizing ballistic and regional activities. We are working on it. The issue is now in Congress. And France has no desire to be embroiled in US domestic politics. But our position on the agreement is clear. On North Korea, we share US concern with recent developments. France has long been the European leader on sanctions against the DPRK. We were instrumental in passing the latest package of EU measures. More pressure is necessary for any future negotiation to be meaningful. And the question though is, do sanctions come too late? And how far is China willing to go? The third thing I have on my mind is how well we cooperate with the US and NATO, on NATO and European security more broadly. France <coughs> is a responsible NATO ally. We fully understand the US insistence on burden sharing and we are on a clear path toward reaching 2% GDP in defense expenses. And believe me, our 2% are not a headquarter percentage. <laughs> they are a war fighting percentage. Although not all our effort is in NATO, it all contributes to NATO security, whether in the Sahel, the Levant, or the North Atlantic, where our Navy cooperates with the US to confront threats. Beyond this, we strongly believe that the Europeans must do more to defend themselves. In that spirit, the French president recently decided to launch a European initiative called a European Intervention Initiative. We have also been key to the creation of the Permanent Structured Cooperation and the European Defence Fund I will be happy to expand on it further. I'd like to conclude with a slightly more global outlook, if you may. France has just concluded, as you just mentioned, a strategic review of her security environment at the request of the French president. And we face growing security challenges in multiple areas around the world. 
And these challenges call for new thinking on how to best assure our command security, which is why we launched this strategic review. This assessment, this assessment, oh sorry, this assessment will serve as a basis for the multi-year defense programming law that we will establish a defense appropriation for the next five years. And I would like to give you a primer on some of its findings. The only thing I can say is that it's bleak. The threats and risk we identify in our previous uh, 2013 white paper materialized more forcefully and more simultaneously than expected. Europe faces the greatest concentration of challenge since the end of the Cold War. As a result, France is exposed and its armed forces are fully committed if not overstretched. French forces are currently committed on four theatres. In response to the front of the ISIS organizations, Al-Qaeda and their affiliates, we lead the military effort to counter terrorism in Mali and help stabilize the country and contribute to the security and stability of the entire Sahel region. We also participate in the US-led coalition in the Levant against ISIS, and French forces are also heavily committed on our national territory, participating directly in the protection of the homeland, as the latest terrorist attack reminded everyone three weeks ago in Marseille. All that, I think, is well known of you. And beyond these commitments, the review clearly states that we must remain vigilant in four other regions of concern. The Balkans, that are still fragile. Sub-Saharan Africa, where our structural weaknesses and ongoing crises require preventive action. The Mediterranean Sea, where we see the convergence of both security issues such as migrations and terrorist activities and defense issues, considering the return of traditional power politics and the concentration of military assets by non-Western countries in the Eastern Med Sea. Finally, Asia, where several arms races are taking place, involving in some cases nuclear weapons, even though this crucial region doesn't have any credible security architecture. The environment is more unstable and more unpredictable. And we observe a worrying tendency to challenge and to weaken international norms. Our immediate environment is sometimes at stake with state and non-state actors having an increasing access to advanced military resources. Western armed forces superiority will probably be eroded in those domains. We expect future operations to be more difficult and more costly. And to address the growing number of common challenges, France must have two objectives. One, to preserve our strategic autonomy. And second, to help build a stronger Europe and a stronger alliance. Preserving our strategic autonomy will require to renew both components of our nuclear deterrent also to devote appropriate efforts in terms of knowledge, anticipation and intelligence, and to retain a full spectrum and balanced military. 
In particular, France should, France, French forces should be capable of autonomous action with respect to nuclear deterrence, the protection of our homeland territory and its approaches, as well as for intelligence command and control, special operations, and last but not least, cyberspace. New investment should focus on certain key capabilities and elements of readiness, intelligence, command and control, I just mentioned it a second ago. And I also want to point out that retaining certain key capabilities, such as nuclear deterrent and a full spectrum military, provides France the legitimacy and credibility that are critical to forge partnerships and uphold the responsibilities of a framework nation. With the same rationale, France must remain a major technological power with a solid defense industry and technology base. Supporting defense innovation and harnessing innovation from the commercial sector will be a key in preserving our military superiority in the long run. And it's one of my key priorities as Minister for, the, for Armed Forces. However, facing such a daunting set of present and future challenges, France cannot do everything alone. We would like to see European defense strengthen based on the growing number of security interests we share with our European partners. Accordingly, we support all ongoing EU and NATO tools and initiatives, such as the one I mentioned earlier, provided that deliver actual results. All this will require a build-up and a corresponding financial effort, and I mentioned that we were on a path toward 2% in defense expenses. Next year already, France will raise its defense budget by over 1.8 billion euros in 2018. I know this is probably less than the Pentagon's laundry bill, but in France, this is a significant 5% increase. And uh, what I would like to conclude with this, don't underestimate those single digit billions. From what I've seen in the cell and in the Levant, when you invest in the French military, you will really get a bang for your back. So thank you for your attention. I'm ready for your questions. Well, Madam Minister, we got a lot of bang out of our buck for those <laughs> wonderful comments. I, colleagues, before you do it, I am totally stealing the phrase, more tank than think. But we put a lot of think in the think tank, yes. so thank you very much. Um, what we'll do with the time we have is uh, I may pose a few questions and then we have a fantastic audience that I know have uh, uh, some additional questions from that very rich offering that you just provided us. I I'd like to start with your fire in the Middle East. Um, and in some ways, we're about to be the victim of, of our success. As the anti-ISIS coalition, the, the victories in Iraq, we're now moving towards other places. We have two challenges as I uh, see them and would welcome your thoughts. Clearly, we still have foreign fighters that are being squeezed, but they have to go somewhere. And you had expressed some very strong comments even a week or two ago about uh, the French uh, citizens that are foreign fighters that are in Syria, how to address that challenge and, and the terrorism and the homeland security part of that. 
My second question is, what does Syria look like? We uh, will have an Assad uh, regime that controls a portion of Syria with Russian air support, Iranian ground support. Is, is that what we're willing to accept? And President Putin's comments about the chemical weapons uh, regime, the normative regime, putting that into question. What is the Syria that we want after we're successful? Huh. A difficult question. Sorry. So first of all, uh, I'm a bit sorry because uh, um, probably my statement about um, uh, remaining terrorists in Syria was a bit too strong and not very d expressed in a diplomatic way. But I'm quite new in the in the job, so sorry for that. But I said just what I I'm think I think uh, we are. Committed. We've been committed uh, in this area along with the coalition for some years now. And we are fighting terrorism, whatever uh, the passport of the terrorist. And we couldn't care less than um, the fact that they are French or Syrians or whatever. They are terrorists. They are threatening us. They are threatening Europe, they are threatening Muslims as well. So my statement was just to say we are combating everyone and uh, if this uh, fight is successful, that's good news, that's, that's all. Now back to your question. Um, Syria is probably the, the most difficult spot, um, as you said. Iraq is progressing uh, if the Kurds uh, issue is uh, set and stabilized, which is not yet completely sure. But probably, if this is the case, Iraq will be able, stage, step by step, to reunify the country. It will take time. In Syria, we don't know. Well, no, because um, the country has been completely destroyed and uh, the regime is uh, progressing on the west part of Syria. And um, we know that after this uh, military uh, period, there will be a political one and we don't know what will happen. So it, it's been very clear that uh, we have nothing to say about Bashar or not Bashar. But we are absolutely convinced that uh, this country needs a political solution. And this political solution is not there available. And that's probably one of the key issues we will discuss with General Mattis. Because we need also to share a common vision about what comes next. What comes next? What comes next for the coalition? Um, and if the coalition were to change uh, its uh, setting, what does it mean? So, sorry, I have questions, but not answers. Well, we're going to keep working on those. We, we appreciate your comments. Let me let me turn to to Europe a, a bit and. I understand what strategic autonomy means in the French sense of, of, uh, the, of the nuclear deterrent and your ability for full spectrum. We now, the European Union is using that term now, that, that term has been adopted in the global strategy, strategic autonomy, and President Macron mentioned that in his vision speech, but I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding what strategic autonomy means within the European Union setting. Um, does this mean that the EU can act independently from NATO, from the US at counter purposes? And, and I put that as a reflection because I think many in Washington didn't fully appreciate after the horrible terrorist attacks in Paris, the, President Hollande uh, invoked Article 42.7, never been invoked about the EU defense. It, it, did invoking that, did that do what, what the, the French government wanted it to do? It was a message of solidarity. Did yeah. it put, in your words, that European intervention initiative, did it put EU defense into the mix? 
help us understand that. I think there's confusion. Well, first of all, uh, today at the time, for the time being, there is a growing conscious within the European member state that their security is at stake is not only one of a country within Europe, but potentially all, and Europe as an entity is also at stake, viewed from terrorists. So there is a, a moment, a, a very positive moment, to trigger uh, a new effort on European defense policy. This is a concept that were, was thoroughly discussed, I think, in the past. I was not there, but uh, I was told. And um, now it's getting more and more, not a concept, but a reality. So we made uh, collectively uh, major steps. I mentioned the uh, PSC and the European Defense Fund, which is something completely new that was uh, uh, unconceivable a uh, few years ago, probably. So Europeans uh, do consider now that their security is something to be looked at and they have to take care of it. That's the first point. The second one is um, above that, uh, President Macron would like to um, uh, create a solidarity between all countries who are willing and able to go to a battlefield because they would consider it as necessary. And for the time being, this is something which is a very long process and in fact the processes are not yet completely set. So his initiative meant um, that, yes, we want to have a quick and operational process to put together different um, European military forces if there is a need for it. And uh, you mentioned um, uh, President Hollande asking for solidarity when the, we, we went to the Mali. And um, tomorrow, if we were to reiterate such an operation on a different theater, ideally, we would like to do it not alone asking then for solidarity, but from scratch doing it with other European countries or any countries who would be willing and able. So is that the meaning of, of be, the be, initiative? No, it, it, and just, I know this is still, this is new, it's still being formed. Uh, it's potentially uh, very exciting. I'm wondering, as the migration crisis continues to roll European politically, as we're mm -hmm. seeing uh, in many uh, European elections, could uh, this uh, the European intervention initiative or this type of readiness, could it be used for a, a more robust border security prevention uh, of, of smugglers, traffickers? That seems to be such an important issue and Europe has really grappled with how to do that in a collective way. Border security is a national uh, competency, but yet it needs to be shared. Yes, it, it needs to be shared and that's exactly the purpose of um, uh, the joint force of G5 cell. Uh, what do we, the idea is to allow uh, the uh, military forces of the five countries concerned, Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad, Niger and Mauritania, um, to work together to take into account powerfully their own security. That's what we are doing as Barkhane with uh, the support of the US and others, and Germany and Spain and others. But if we don't succeed in uh, implementing a powerful and efficient military forces uh, from the region, then we will not be efficient. And one of the uh, assignment 
of uh, this um, joint force is also to control the borders and they, the force will be allowed to go back and forth the borders to make sure that uh, we can track efficiently traffics mm. and terrorists. Of course, it's a huge work. Uh, and for sure, as France, even with the very strong support we benefit from allies, we will never succeed. So we definitely need a local initiative. And that's why I, I underline that much, that we need your support as a community just to help understand that this is a strong need. This is not just uh, money poured on the sand. It is something that will happen. And uh, the operations that uh, is prepared in the coming days now will be a first uh, uh, training to demonstrate that this is possible. It seems the G5 Sahel issue is going to be such a cr critical test of, yes, some, it is. of, some, of mm. some new initiatives. Very exciting. Last question before we turn to the audience. I think one thing that you and Secretary Mattis uh, can, can jointly talk about is the challenge of readiness. And I say that looking at the, the map that uh, uh, the ministry provided, uh, over 30,000 French forces deployed worldwide. You mentioned 4,000 of those are in, in, in high intensity situations. If I understand correctly, please please uh, challenge me on this, over 10% of the French military actually deployed internally to France to provide the necessary uh, security, homeland security uh, aspect against uh, terrorist acts. This is a huge challenge of just maintaining that operational tempo, that readiness. And as you mentioned in the strategic review, the real challenge of sustainment. The average uh, length of operations are 10 to 15 years. We don't budget for 10 to 15 years. Huge set of challenges. Four months, as you look at the, the, the enormity of this challenge, where are your priorities in, in, the, in the readiness and making sure that French, French military forces that weren't necessarily designed to guard churches and train stations, that they maintain that level of readiness so they can be de rapidly deployed if required. Yeah, it's true. We have 10, up to 10,000 people, soldiers uh, protecting uh, the home and territory. And um, this is to last. So what we decided a few weeks ago is to redesign the process because we have to uh, take care of stations, of course, permanen permanently, also churches and everything. But we have also to be more flexible or ready to intervene wherever it's necessary and whenever. So we have to work on mobility, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that matches completely with what our soldiers ask for, because they are not trained exactly to to remain uh, uh, to remain uh, stable uh, and um, they are trained to to run to to use uh, the force uh, and so they are quite I wouldn't say satisfied I'm not sure they are satisfied fully to do that but they know that this is necessary and so we try to make the best use of this um, of this force because it has a cost of course, of course. and uh, we have not a huge uh, army like the US has and uh, we have to be present on our national um, territory but also very much present and with a lasting presence even if we're ready to discuss how we can do that with uh, General Mattis when we are working together. Absolutely, thank you. Colleagues, let me uh, welcome you into this conversation. If you could please raise your hand, uh, identify yourself and your affiliation. Please keep your question very short so we can take as many as possible. And please, uh, the microphone, it's sometimes a little hard to hear up here. If you can speak very directly and clearly into that microphone, it will help us. So I'm gonna sort of go across this way. So if we could have a microphone over here, please. Sorry, we're just coming around here. 
Keep those hands up so we can see. Thank you. We'll start, Donna, right there. Thank you. Please stand up and uh, yes, give us your name. Speak directly into that microphone. Thank you. Madam Minister, thank you for being with us despite your cold. Diana Negroponte from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, where we also receive French scholars. My concern listening to your words is that the European Defense Initiative would appear to be an alternative to NATO. You have the 27, maybe the Brits, the 28 members, but this new initiative would exclude Turkey and the United States. What assurance can you give to us that you're not setting up an alternative defense initiative? Madam Minister, we'll take several questions. And there's one right beside, right there. Donna, thank you. Hello, my name is Megan Donahoe. I'm with Search for Common Ground. Bonjour et bienvenue aux États-Unis. Uh, you mentioned that President Macron takes civil society very seriously, and I was wondering in Sahel, the Sahel, and Sub-Saharan Africa, how you would engage local civil societies in security arrangements. Thank you. We'll take one more, and then we'll pause, and we'll uh, just write back there. Thank you. Uh, Madame la Ministre, bonjour. Alice Pagnier, je suis. I am sorry. I am an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of International Studies. I also had a question regarding the European Intervention Force. I was wondering what sort of mission it would be designed for, uh, is if it's expeditionary missions, and then how it could build on work that has been done uh, as part of the framework nation concept of NATO with the UK-led Joint Expeditionary Force, for example, that gathers many EU member states, such as um, the Netherlands, uh, Estonia, um, as well as the UK. Thank you. So is the EU defense plan an alternative to NATO? How can we engage civil society more potentially in the Sahel as part of the counterterrorism activities? And is the European Intervention Initiative, how can it be combined with perhaps NATO's framework nation right. concept, the Joint Expeditionary Forces? You can tell there's a lot of interest in the European yeah. Defense Plan. So I will be extremely short and will share a strong conviction. The EU initiative coming from the EU or coming from France asking for other uh, European countries to go together, to be able to go together uh, wherever they, they, they need, is not undermining NATO, not at all. Why? Because um, the day Europe uh, invests in its own protection and security, that day, Europe contributes even more to its commitment to NATO. So this is something which is completely, uh, um, com that can be combined and not be opposed. So I have absolutely no doubt that this is, this is not meant to undermine the NATO commitment, not at all. It is just meant to be more efficient when, as Europe, we are uh, and we feel uh, unsecured, and not unsecured only on the eastern part of Europe, but also in the southern part of Europe. And we have to deal with those two constraints. And um, the question about um, what uh, the uh, European initiative is, uh, um, can do, of course. Well, at this stage, I have not yet uh, any example to provide, of course. But as I mentioned, I'm sure that uh, if this European uh, initiative had existed when we, st when we, we started to, to go to Mali, I'm sure that this would have been a, a, a good example of what this initiative could have done if it had existed. Now, um, this is a big uh, operation. Of course, there could be uh, smaller ones. And what I've not mentioned in my, in my uh, answer 
is about the financing of it. Because I said that um, you, uh, Europe is working hard on building a European Defense Fund, which is new. But it doesn't mean that Europe is still ready to finance all what member states invest in their day-to-day -day operations abroad. And this is also one very serious question we have to solve at European level. And that's why President Macron said, we are financing that on our own, but we would like very much to extend this financing to European contribution as well, which means that we should be able to revisit some processes that we have within Europe, which doesn't, which are not aimed at doing so. Excellent. Let's take a quick three. We have three questions right in the back, three in the row right there, and then we'll have Minister uh, give her closing remarks right there to the left. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andrew Hanna. I'm a reporter with Politico. Um, so. Washington has been somewhat cool on the G5 Sahel regional architecture project before, but there's some suggestion that with the recent deaths of U.S. troops in Niger that the U.S. position might change on this. Uh, do you plan to talk about this topic with Secretary Mattis today, and do you have any like, sense that momentum might be changing on this from the U.S. side? Thank you. Right behind. Hi, good morning. Alex Sanchez, I'm a writer for James Defense. I'm going to piggyback on the last question. If you can talk more about what you're gonna, going to discuss with General Mattis uh, today, what else is on the agenda? And second of all, you talked about uh, French defense industry as a key of priority for you. Can you talk more about weapon sales from French um, companies abroad? I cover that in America. I know France is trying to sell warplanes to Argentina, um, frigates to, uh, to Colombia and Uruguay. If you can talk more about that too. Thank you. And the final one right behind, right there. Thank you. Good morning. Federico Cazzola from the Embassy of Italy. Um, talking about the migration crisis in the Mediterranean, do you see France working more closely with Italy to ensure the saving of lives and prevent migrant trafficking? Three excellent questions. So lots of questions on the G5 Sahel, and perhaps if you want to preview some conversation you'll have with Secretary Mattis, uh, that you'll have that meeting uh, later today, and then Migration, bilateral cooperation with Italy. Well, <clears throat> yes, we will discuss this with um, General Mattis. Uh, it's of utmost importance for us. Um, and I'm pretty sure that uh, General Mattis will be sensitive to it. Um, just because he knows that we are strongly committed in this field, that is a very demanding fight and that we need to find support everywhere we can. So I'm not sure it's so important to discuss about the way to support it. So whatever it comes from the UN or from bilateral support that we already have from the US but that we would like to increase, of course. Um, I would say I wouldn't care less. The only thing I care is that this support comes. Otherwise, probably in uh, five years from now, uh, the situation that I would commend to you if you would invite me again. Done. Would <laughs> be to say, yeah, well, the situation does not make much progress and that we can't afford, of course, because if we don't make progress, terrorists will. Um, on the migration crisis, um, well, um, we are with our Italian allies. We are with them. Uh, I cooperate very efficiently with Italy. I have extremely good relationship with my counterpart. Um, so um, I know that uh, Libya is probably a, a specific place of concern for Italy, but we are working also 
to find solutions, to find ways to avoid both traffics and illegal migrations and uh, human beings' uh, bad treatments that happen in this area. So we are really close on these issues as well as all the others we discuss thoroughly about European Defence Fund and uh, cooperation within the Euro in the European framework. So again, um, Italy, Germany, Spain are our best, best support in Europe to try building this uh, initiative we, we try to promote. Do you want to say anything about the, uh, your defense um, um, industrial component? Uh, certainly seen a lot of vibrancy, whether that's in India, Argentina, elsewhere. Any comments on that? Well, much smaller than the American one. We have, we definitely have a uh, defense industry. And we are proud of it because it's also one of the basis of the autonomy we are building every day and try to keep. So as any country having a, a, a defense industry, we need also to export. That's necessary. I would say that's a business model. Otherwise, you need an uh, enormous amount of money uh, to get the, the abilities, the technologies that are needed today. So, yes, sometimes we succeed in exporting our uh, weapons and um, military systems. So, of course, we have to be extremely cautious to whom is it uh, safe to do it? Do we comply with uh, international rules? Of course we have to do that. But uh, these rules are set accordingly. So we, we uh, do our best to comply with them. Well, Madam Minister, thank you so much. Uh, you, you gave a really comprehensive and important thoughts and insights that have helped us understand greater French uh, security priorities and its defense needs. Thank you so much for your partnership, the embassy. Uh, we benefit from incredible French diplomats that enrich our research. Thank you. Thank you for managing this conversation with a cold. That's uh, above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, thank you for agreeing to come back to CSIS at a future date. We'll, uh, we'll work with your calendar. Uh, but most importantly, thank you uh, for the incredible uh, partnership uh, and military cooperation. The United States is a safer place uh, for it. So we thank you so much. Just a word before you can all thank the minister as well. If everyone can please remain seated uh, at the end, we're going to depart, uh, escort the minister and the delegation out. And then as soon as we're out the door, uh, please uh, enjoy a fantastic fall weekend. So now with your applause, please thank the minister for her comments. Thank you.